Hey guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Parker Imerl, and this is The Conversation Station. Today's guest is a driven entrepreneur, social scientist, and podcast host with a strong commitment to leveraging technology for the greater good. He is CEO and co-founder of Solaris, a company that seeks to revolutionize the way we approach and implement technology through data visualization. Additionally, he co-founded the People's Collective for Change, a nonprofit dedicated to empowering marginalized communities through education and advocacy. He is also the host of The Company, a podcast that amplifies the voices of inspiring unsung heroes, including innovators, entrepreneurs, and community leaders who share their stories and insights. With a background in sociology and psychology from UC Davis, his interests lie in fields of computational social science and futurism. Let's give a warm welcome to the one and only Joshimar Graham. Welcome on, sir. I appreciate that. And very good job with a lot of words that usually aren't said out loud often. Yeah. So. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I, I had run. See, I, I had read I had read the intro that I had written up um, in my head a couple times, but I hadn't I, but I had not really said it out loud. I'm like, uh, oh, and, and when I when I my my laptop is only like a 13 inch laptop and it's sitting five feet away from me. So it's like trying to focus in on that i need to get i need to get like a monitor or something to hook up to it but man i'm so i'm so happy to have you here you want to just tell tell the audience a bit about yourself and uh and then we'll just take it from there yeah sure i mean first of all thanks for having me on um typically i'm the one hosting everyone um so this is probably my first yeah i think this is my first podcast that i'm not hosting so that's fun um i guess a little bit about me uh you know I have a bunch of random titles that have been thrown around, so I'll try to provide some background to that. But I was born overseas in Jamaica, lived there for 10 years, uh, moved to the United States on my own at about yeah, 11 years old. Um, I lived in New York, lived in New Jersey. Um, so if you're from anywhere on the East Coast, that's my spot. Uh, I moved to California with my mother. She is a sommelier in Napa. Um, so we lived down there for about four years, transitioned from Napa to UC Davis. Well, before that, I actually, um, got my, uh, I got three associates in, uh, Napa junior college. So I went there originally, I was like a hooper. So I was focused on kinesiology at first transition to psychology, sociology, and communications. Um, and then I went to UC Davis after, um, double majored in psychology and sociology again as my, uh, majors and then got minors in communication and business. Um, and yeah, you know, now I'm in Sacramento and I've been out here for about a year. Um, we've just been working, started the company podcast just to have a place for, you know, entrepreneurs and creatives to have discussions that kind of push the needle forward on the businesses that they have. And then in the background, I have been working on that startup, uh, Solaris. We're still going to be changing up that name. It's been like 30 iterations, but, um, yeah, we, we, we started working on that and the goal was, you know, to use technology in a way that I feel like is is missing right now, where it's actually taken seriously as tools to improve our lives and, you know, be able to um, connect not only businesses, but storylines and passions. And um, yeah, we've been building out several projects for that and, you know, just using the time um, to kind of talk, learn, build and grow. Um, and that's been kind of the last five years. Man, that's, it's incredible to, to, uh, here and I think uh, when you're talking about technology and looking at it as a tool, I think that's a big thing people are really missing as AI becomes more prominent, as people get immediately scared by AI. And I have this quote from Rodney uh, that I stole and took it as my own because he told me I could take it as my own because he said it to me in the car and it's mine now. It's uh, um, I, be I believe it is um, don't um, don't glorify the past because you're scared of the future. And it's like people are scared of the future. And so they're like, oh, it was better this way back back when. But when I take a look at AI as a tool, I look at I, I, that's what I look at, at, look at it as purely a tool. I mean, look at look at the iPhone, right? The iPhone is a tool. I could use it to go watch TikTok dances all day or I could go watch three hours from Gary V and 
and and dive into content it's a it's a tool and so as of late with like the, this last week i have been ai 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 uh i put out a little piece on ai and it did way better than my content usually does um especially on tiktok my stuff on tiktok usually gets 61 views i think it's sitting around 800 views on tiktok congrats, congrats. but um it's um it's very interesting. In fact, there's this AI tool I've been so blown away by. Uh, so you might appreciate it as a, as a podcaster yourself. Um, it's called autopod.fm, and it's a plugin for Premiere Pro uh, editing software for those of you at home who don't know. Uh, and it will automatically take your multi-cam, like your multiple cameras, like for this interview, all I'm going to do is I'm going to feed it both of our camera feeds and, tell, and then it will automatically cut between them. Mm. And it's like... So, so normally, uh, you, when you had to reschedule them yesterday, normally that would be a stressor where I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm only going to have eight, like, you know, eight hours or whatever to edit it, to get it out tomorrow. And a lot of the time, it's not the time. It's, it's the fact that editing that and clicking between the cameras manually, it's not very fun. <laughs> like at the end of the day, the fun part is producing the content or doing the clips or finding the parts that are enjoyable. But the actual manual crunch time editing is not very fun. And so something like this, it's like, hey, it'll get the rough cut done. I just have to adjust a couple of things. And it takes two minutes. It, it literally takes two minutes for, edit, for it to edit an hour of footage, which is, which I am just, I'm surprised that Premiere, that Adobe hasn't integrated something like that natively because every, every video um, uh, video application you use can do that. I mean, look at Zoom. It it will whoever's talking. It just cuts to that, and it's not very difficult. And so, I'm just excited to look at AI as a tool and not not have that fear around it. And especially as I've been helping my mom with her business and my sister. My sister is by far the most opposed to AI in my entire family, and I've been trying to like teach her and show her that it's a tool it's not it's game changing but it's not something that completely changes the way you approach everything you still have to take it with the same mindset as you do everything else it's a tool there are places where it's good to use places where it's bad and you've got to constantly be cautious and constantly be innovating yeah, a hundred percent. You hit the nail on the head there. And, um, you know, there's a couple different things that I feel like I've wanted to unpack for a while, but, um, I've never really been able to have a conversation about it. So with my studies, one of the biggest things is that I'm interdisciplinary. So I focus on psychology, but to be a better psychologist, I have to learn about people. So I learned about sociology and then to learn about people, you have to communicate to them. So, you know, you learn about communications. And then this last year, um, I started wrapping in uh, this new thing uh, called computational social sciences. So it's one of the best classes I took at Davis. My professor actually works um, for the UN as an advisor on economic and uh, socioeconomic policy surrounding technology. So he's like one of the like guys on the forefront of this stuff. Um, and he put it into my mind that we are on the precipice of a completely new generation of technologies. Like while yes. it, it go ahead. Yeah. Ab absolutely continue yeah no like while while it is a tool and um i love rodney's analogy because i do think people glorify the past way too much it's like the past to you from this future perspective where you're sitting in uh, ac and lights everywhere is, is wonderful but i don't think many people have had to like go manually plow a field or go walk 30 miles to go meet their friend or tell a friend hey i'm gonna send you uh uh, 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 uh what is it what was it even called um mail right like actual physical mail send it to their house and it's like you have to be at your house at that specific day at that specific time or we might never be able to talk again because we don't have any phones to communicate so people always look back and they say it was always better back then and it's it's hindsight hindsight bias but um the way that I look at AI in general, at least for right now, is that it is very similar to the first time we took up a, a, a rock and cracked open a coconut. Like that rock became a piece of technology for our civilization and we used it to feed ourselves, to, to you know, better our communities, et cetera, et cetera. And as we grew, we got more and more complicated technology. So we started compounding them on each other. We have cars there. Nobody's ever said, oh, cars are the end of the world. You know, maybe the guys that used to um, run like horse racing and stuff, 
they were probably pretty sad about that. But, you know, um, we've embraced a lot of technologies before very quickly. The problem with AI that a lot of people are having is that it's, it's cutting too close to what we feel makes humans special. Right. Like when you sit down and you look at the things that AI is able to do, people start feeling, oh, like, does it think it can do it better than me? Yeah. And that's kind of what I've been seeing. So when you talk to, talk about like your sister having a pushback on that, um, my mom was in that same category. And there's two terms uh, that I feel like are really important to learn about when you see those things. The first one is it's called a Luddite. And it sounds like you're kind of cursing at somebody, but a Luddite is basically someone that um, they do not enjoy new technologies and they try not to adopt them, right? They stay away from them. And one of the reasons why you become a Luddite is because of this thing called technological aversion. So you have a fear or a, misunderstanding about technology and that causes you to kind of stray away from using them yeah i mean i think but I, I also think that's an an analogy for life i think that everyone will stray away or be scared of something they don't understand but i think i think what people need to need to understand most importantly about ai is it's not going away anytime soon it is it is the it is the greatest technological um advance in my opinion since the iphone i mean because since the iphone it's just been like improvements to performance which is which in terms of the general tech industry right i'm not going to talk specifically about like for video editing or for something because that's but generally it's like okay something that was widespread the iphone was huge the internet was huge but since then we have been in this slow move forward and now i mean just in the past five years you look at where um uh, OpenAI's GPT was five years ago when they were when it, their first couple of versions. It was terrible, but the fact that now I that I can use it to do pretty much everything and 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 you just you have to know how to control it. But I think what what people need to understand is it's not replacing the human. It's changing what is needed from us. So it's going from a place of hey, you know. We need people. It's like it's like back in the olden times when, let's say, we had someone whose job was like, I don't know, to, to yeah, like to to plow the fields, right, or or something like that, where you have someone whose job is to manually plow the entire field. Well, guess what? Now our job as humans is shifting from being that person plowing the field to simply being the person driving the tractor. Mm -hmm. And that's the change we're going through. And I know it's hard for people to accept, but I think that once people accept it, they can realize the power. And it, it, it really, if you take advantage of AI in your business, I know that's what everyone's saying now, take advantage of it. But there's a reason that everyone's saying it, that there is a person in every facet of, of entrepreneurship, every facet of success saying AI is the future. And the, the thing about that, uh, that was a wonderful analogy. Like, you know, we are now driving the tractor and we need to make sure that we know that because if you are put in front of a technology that is this powerful, um, especially one that can do a, a, a multitude of different tasks and you don't know that you're controlling it, you face a lot of repercussions from that. But I feel like the the thing that I want people to understand is this is what we've been asking for as a society for a very, very long time. We are tired of menial labor. We're tired of doing work that isn't creative and uninspired, and we don't want to do mundane, repetitive tasks. That's what everyone is asking for. Everyone has asked for a universal basic health care, universal income, all of these different things. And none of those things work in a society where humans have to do the manual labor because they will, it would always be in hierarchy. It would always be the people at the top that are doing the creative intensive work and then the people at the bottom that are doing manual jobs that don't take much creativity so what i think ai is going to do is going to kind of remove that gap where now instead of having humans down here doing the work our tools can take care of this and then we have to simultaneously elevate the bottom line to make those people as creative as possible so that the technologies at the bottom can learn from them so i take a a, a very uh, symbiotic approach when i look at how this needs to be integrated because I do see the arguments for the other side and like the fears of, you know, copywriters are losing their job. Um, you know, their uh, uh, creatives are saying that, um, have you seen the AI uh, Drake video? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so stuff like that. I, I see the fear for that, but that is just the same thing of any adoption. Like when people just got the iPhone, the first people that had the iPhone were able to manipulate and do things that the other group couldn't. So it's, it's instead, I think, you know, making this more widely available to the masses, teaching them how to control these new machines. Um, I, I think that is going to take a, a lot of the fear away. Yeah, and I, I, I just think that the way, um, the, the, the role of a human in business is evolving. It's going from like there's, you're always gonna have to. I think the one skill that will never go away is being able to communicate with people. Right? The AI might get good at it, but the fact is. I never have the AI write something and just send it out blindly. I'm always going to read it over. And I, I, I 99% of the time I'm revising something. There's something not right. Or, or I tell the AI, hey, I actually want you to rephrase that to sound more like this. Mm -hmm. um, I know. And it, it has been a powerful tool for my mom where uh, with her business, she struggled on the marketing side of things because she hates writing copy. <laughs> And so, and so now she's like, oh, I got to write this. I'm like, oh, yeah, just have your assistant do that. And I'm always referring to chat GPT as an assistant, which truly it is. It is, a, it is an assistant to whatever. And it's all about, it is about how you use it. I've seen it time and time again. There are so many purposes for AI. And it's, I think the, the, the best part of this AI revolution is we are seeing is it is inspiring people where the, like, these people that wouldn't necessarily want be able to do something can do it or or even some tools that don't involve AI as much where it's just like that auto that auto FM thing it's not that much of AI it's basically simple waveform detection how loud is the volume so it can switch cameras but the fact is that tool probably would not exist right now without this AI wave we are seeing so I think the biggest benefit of AI is seeing how it can transform humans and the way we approach the world. Right. And it's, it's I think we're in a generation of augmenting the human capability. Um, every single tool that you're seeing coming out right now, it's not, like you said, it's not operating on its own. How it's operating is in tandem with the people doing the work. And I love how you put it. In business right now, the role of the human is not necessarily the same anymore. We don't have to wear 30, 40 different hats. Now we have a powerful system and our goal is to direct it somewhere. Um, for so like a great example I can give, and this is a non-traditional way to look at it. A lot of people talk about AI in business, but AI in education is actually amazing too. I have been, um, I'm going to be pursuing my PhD research in, um, it's a pretty big topic, but basically like a understanding of how, um, humans, create imagination and like how we work through, um, you know, dreaming and all of these different things. And I have a ton of research that on the top doesn't seem related to, to anything. And I'm not in a position right now where I can go down the street and talk to someone about a PhD paper. So what do I do? I take my research and I train a model on it. Well, that's the wrong terminology. I train a chat on it and I give it all the information and I ask it, I'm like, compare this to some other research papers. Like, what do you feel about the idea so far? And that feedback, I think, is one of the greatest advantages of the platform is that you can have someone to talk to that understands directly what you're saying and then your feedback constantly helps it learn. Absolutely. So have you heard of the um, of, of what they're going to be integrating into the Microsoft Office suite in terms of AI? Have you heard about that? I've heard something about it. Um, I've heard not, not too much. So this is I, I saw this a couple of months ago, which like this stuff takes time, but I'm excited once it comes out. I don't even use uh, like Office or any of that. I use Google Google Docs because it's free, but I'm excited to play around with it. I love playing around with these new AI tools, but the the concept is like, OK, you have an Excel document, right? Or or you have this stuff just within your your your, your all your office files that has like okay you you just paste in a ton of data unorganized nothing there the the concept behind the stuff they're integrating into like excel is like okay um you you there will be an an agent within the excel where you're just like okay you know sort this data and create charts and find correlations between this and and this boom 
and it'll do it for you where in in years past you would have had to pay someone you know 50 bucks an hour to someone who 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 specializes in data analysis but the fact is even people like that that do something that ai will be able to do you're still going to need those people to to you those are the people that will know how to get this ai to work properly they will be the guides see we we are switching from we we are just becoming the guides that's 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 the difference now we are no longer the explorer we are the guide and it's a great term you should uh take that before i steal it oh uh, no yeah no i i just said that i'm like oh oh god i gotta put that as a as a quote up on instagram or something yeah. um or or, or put a piece of content up about that but i i think that that's where where things are really changing and it's it's scary because it's new and i'm not going to act like i don't find it scary at, at at times but but my but i think as an entrepreneur or just or as someone who approaches anything with an entrepreneurial mindset you've got to be able to recognize when something's going to stay and if it's going to stay you've got to take advantage 100% and i i think I don't know. I have a I have a very deep, deep appreciation for the things that are being built right now because when I was growing up, I always read a lot of books about sci-fi and like these the age of like spiritual machines and all of these amazing things. And like personally, my role models have always been like Iron Man, like Batman, those type of people. So I'm like, bro, if we're in an age now where Jarvis is not is about three steps away from Chat GPT, right? Like this, so Jarvis would be called um artificial general intelligence so right now um chat gpt is just a large language model it just understands language but when you jump a step from that and you take language and you you kind of extrapolate it you make it um, understand the different aspects of being a human in our society it turns into artificial general intelligence and that's something where you could be like hey i need to go drive down the street but my left tire is wonky and then my mom is coming home on tuesday but she's allergic to chicken and it'll figure out what all of those <laughs> things mean yeah. and, like what you need to do yeah um Ch chat gpt4 is i i haven't gotten to play with it yet but i've heard it's like that but you want to hear something crazy microsoft is releasing a a tool by the name of microsoft jarvis mm. and this tool um is is a link between ai tools and so it will allow your chat gpts to take advantage of your mid journey to take advantage of these other things and so it is basically turning chat gpt <laughs> into a general model and of course they called it jarvis someone was going to coin that name eventually for an actual ai tool but uh you can also use the chat gpt and the siri api if you have a mac to literally have siri mm -hmm. be chat gpt and so you can talk to it and it's it's just freaking incredible Honestly, I really hate Microsoft because they're always ahead of the curve on everything. Like Apple is innovative as hell, but Microsoft, they just buy up all the ideas because um, actually I work for a startup right now that works in the Microsoft ecosystem. So yeah, that's funny. I love Microsoft. Don't take that back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that, you know, I'm personally, my, my project that I'm working on right now is a Jarvis-like project. It's um, right now we have it under the code name Icon, which is um, intelligent. <sighs> okay, I'm actually not going to go into that because I keep, I always jump into um, ideas that aren't fully fleshed out yet. But the goal of the, the platform is basically we take these large language models and we train them on human experts so that they have these one-to-one -one replicas of how... Oh, that's freaking genius. You know what I mean? And then we, we sell these icons as, um, as guides where people can use them to set up their schedules. They can use them to, um, you know, go about their day-to-day -day lives having customized learning plans built from icons. So that's been kind of our thing. And that's our take on how to build out artificial general intelligence is to Dude. have the experts training. Oh, my God. That is inc – Dude, that's freaking crazy. Because um, one of the things that I've, want, I've done is, like, I'll, I'll tell Jack. Chat, chat GPT, you are now marketing expert Gary V. But it doesn't know. It doesn't. It, it knows of Gary V. But yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't have the data. So, but but if you train something where it's like, okay, here's Gary V. Here's how he approaches marketing. And look, it's Gary V. Ever everything that he has ever done or his entire concept is out there on the internet. Um, 
And this is one of the things uh, I find interesting as I have been really diving into a lot of stuff. And I was watching something by um, Alex or Mosey. I don't. I still can't figure out how to say that last name. But no, you got it. You got but, it. But, but okay. Um, and and I was um, and he was saying. Give everything you do away for free. Show people how you do it because 1% will take advantage and the other 99% won't and then they'll come to you asking for help. And so my, my point there being like, hey, I think, but I think that what, what AI is doing is really closing, taking that 99% and slowly bringing it down, 98, 97, 95, and it's cutting it down just a little bit. And I still think that... It's it's always going to be one of those things where there are people that will take advantage and people that won't. But I know personally, I have been trying to take advantage as best I can. And I think that one of the biggest things is we need to get this, like my generation, this current generation, are I think that they are struggling with finding that their 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 place in terms of business and especially for me like right i'm 16 really i don't know crap about business but what i think people need to uh accept uh is um someone will see someone successful on on instagram for for example okay they have one million followers they'll be like hey well it's so easy for you to get leads for your business because you have a million followers but if if you start today then you will get there one day if you're constantly learning. And I, so I think this generation needs to take a step back. I think that our, my generation takes things with a little bit too much of a victim mentality. Sure, there are people where life is hard for them, but I think that we need to take it from a, okay, my life sucked, but it, now it's my chance to improve it. And so I, as, as I look at the, the rest of the people at my age, it, it sucks for me to see that, but I also recognize the opportunity that in the future there are going to be the, the, the people that take advantage as we move into this generation. It's going to be incredible. A thousand percent. And I feel, you know, um, I feel like I had a very similar outlook at 16 as well. Like I'm 24 right now. Um, so I can still actually remember when I was 16, which is, is crazy to me. Um, and I will, first of all, first of all, I would say kudos to you because you're going down the right path um, in terms of what you're doing, right? The, the problem that I think you're going to have is you're going to have to wrap your head around outliers and you're going to have to wrap your head around, um, there, there's this idea called the Pareto distribution, right? where it is basically, it's a, it's a fundamental fact. Like there's nothing that breaks this theory. Everything falls in line with it. That 99% that you're talking about, right? That will always be the majority of people. There, there will always be these people on this there side. There will always be a majority. There will always be a majority, right? But how the Pareto distribution goes into it is basically, it takes this idea and it says that um, out of the 100 uh, most played artists, right? 1% of that 100 songs are made, that, sorry, 1% of all the music we listen today is made by 1% of all the artists that ever existed. And 1% of all those artists make 1% of all that music. So it, it gets smaller and smaller where it's always the smallest amount of people do the most amount of work. So when you're looking at your generation, it is going to be... Um, I think kind of like what you said, maybe taking that 1% and jumping it to like a five, where now 5% of your generation is doing the work because they have all of these tools and um, these resources now that they can they can shift that. But it, it, it will always be an outlier. Like, you know, most people are never going to really sit down and put in the work it needs to, um, that needs to happen just because we're not really incentivized to do that too well. Yeah, and uh, I, I do find it interesting where I think, I think what what – what AI is going to do is it's going to open the gates a little bit, but, but I also see this issue where, where as our lives as humans become easier through technology and, and especially in America, we have the, like, like my take is we have the best lives of any country in the world. And so I think, at, and, and this is a quote I, I've heard, uh, time and time again is, um, 
bad times create good men, and we could extrapolate this to hu- humans as a whole, but this is the quote I've heard. Bad times create good m- men, good men create good times, good times create bad men. And I think we are in a situation where we look at just across across the board, wherever anyone aligns politically, I think we can all see the fact that there is some over-victimization of, of the world going on right now, where you see people who really have it better than, than anyone else did in the past. And it's it, it's sort of a a, a a a victim Olympics, and I'm not denying in any regard that people have it hard. I know they do. I've seen it firsthand. But I think that 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 mindset is almost taking that five percent that's opening from technology and shifting it back a little bit. And I think that's always what's constantly going to happen. There's always going to be something that opens the gap, and then there's going to be something else that closes it. And so I think as we progress. I think that the fundamental elements of society won't go away. There will always be that 1%. And I think it just comes down to who's willing to put in the time, energy, and effort towards whatever they want to pursue. Whoever's going to go relentlessly without giving up, no matter what. You fail, try again. Win or you learn. Attack, attack, attack. That's what's going to define success for millennia. It's what's defined success for millennia and what will define success for millennia to come. And I agree, and uh, that's a that's a big picture um, view of it because yeah, in the current the current um, system, right? Um, people have no reference point. I feel like they they hear about the tragedies of the past. I'll specifically look at the black community, right? Um, our community hears a lot about slavery. We have grandparents that may have either been in it or have some sort of association to it. Um, we face racial discrimination now, we do X, Y, and Z, we look at how our populations make the least amount of money, we have all of these statistics that are thrown at us, but they come with no context. They don't talk about the fact that, you know, um, throughout history, there has been multiple instances of this. And while our our situation is is close to heart, you know, it it is difficult to point a finger on how to fix it, right? You know, like SF is doing this whole push for giving everybody reparations. And it's like throwing money on a problem doesn't solve anything. And it it actually enhances that victim mentality because now you jump from, say, okay, the black... uh, black population gets reparations, then we can look and say, okay, did the Jewish population actually get compensated correctly? And then you you jump through those different loops and we're trying to retroactively fix these problems that aren't going to be fixed instead of looking towards the future. And I think that's where the the closing of the gap comes into play that you're talking about. Yeah, and I think um, I think an issue is people are looking looking straight to the past, right, and looking and not looking to the future. And when it comes to these problems, I think throwing money on a problem is never going to fix it. Just like all these lottery winners constantly gro- going broke because they don't have the skills to back them up. And so, if you're going to throw money at a problem, these 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 generational issues that come down to more than skin color, which may have originated from that, but they have grown to be much more, where it is a it is a societal thing where it's like okay you are by by throwing money at a problem you only amplify the issues mm-hmm. that already exist and so I, I I look at it and I think that if we if we want to look future forward and not look at the issues of the past um, I think what you've got to look at is you've got to look at the fact that hey things are getting better and so you have to look at the future and be like okay well if 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 the issue is this right. Like, I I can't speak to what is right in that community because I'm not a part of it. But I I know that there are leaders in that community that that if they take a step back and are like, okay, the past is the past. We should learn from the past, but let's not focus on it. Let's look at the greater picture and okay, say, okay, well, if this is the issue, if because there are there are financial problems, okay, well, what is what are the root causes? Okay, and now let's just take the steps to fix them. And I think that's a mentality that you don't just apply to marginalized communities. You can apply it to anything. Like, hey, if if, if you're depressed, don't just say, oh, I'll feel better if I buy my new a new car. Take a look at, okay, well, okay. Maybe I'm depressed because something happened with my parents when I was young. Okay, and now let's move back. L- okay, well, let's let's take a future forward approach to the past where we're looking at the past, but purely for the reason of improving our futures, not because we we are owed something by society for what happened to us in the past. Like, hey, okay, a, a few months ago,
go, you know, like this is just an example. Okay, let's say someone's girlfriend broke up with him. Okay, so now, now, now society owes me something because that caused me pain. But I think if we, if we can look back at that and like, okay, that caused me pain. And now I know, okay, maybe I don't want to go after a girl like that in the future. And that's, that's my take on all of this. And I think it is, it's, it's scary. It scares a lot of people when they have... When, when when they try to talk about issues that involve race, but you have to take the race out of the equation and look at it as as a society. A hundred percent. And, you know, that term uh, society is something that I don't think most people understand. Um, you know, a, a society is like, and I, I actually was doing some research on this last night. It's It's almost like a collective conscience, right? It, it's not one thing. It is built because of each of our individual decisions and it reflects how those decisions combine. And if people understood that, they would understand just how much we can change our society for the better. And you see examples of it right now. I actually don't enjoy the way that these examples are being used, but um, you know that's my personal opinion on things. But when you see things like the conversations around um, gender, right? And people are saying gender is a construct. They're right, gender is a construct, but it doesn't diminish what that construct is. That is a construct that came from hundreds of thousands of years of conversations of saying, hey, we have a bunch of people that don't know what to do or who to be. Let's try to give them some structure and let's create these two spheres that we can act out our societal roles. And now people are at a point where, you know, you talked about it, we're comfortable, right? A lot of the problems that we had surrounding gender and like organizing our species are no longer existing. We don't need hunters and gatherers. We don't need family, um, family first. And then uh, we don't need quote unquote quote because we definitely still do but you know all of these dynamics are being questioned and shifted and I, I feel like if people focused on some of the more important societal dynamics things that you were talking about like how do we build a generation of people that look at problems like their opportunities and and we fight through them and we run through towards them because it's an opportunity to help our collective I feel like we'd be in a better place so you know that I think that's the biggest push is just to have people understand that they are the authors of their own stories and by writing their own stories they can write the collective story as well yeah it's it it it's something that you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, I I just I think that that one of the uh, the issues I see with with my generation is from this from this victimization. Like, look, the the America has not had a crisis since nine eleven. There has been nothing to bring. The only other thing that has happened is the pandemic. But the pandemic just split people apart. My dad always tells me, "You, the um, America has never been more together than post and right after nine eleven. And so, if you look, if you look at that and just just look at it in a in a regard of the as as we grow comfortable we begin to fight amongst ourselves and so I, my issue is that as we begin to fight amongst ourselves we 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 lose we lose perspective as you've said and the the issue i see is we've lost perspective as to critical thinking as to problems as as i look at 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 peers um and, and i see the fact that when when someone says a take right they're like okay i hate xyz or this is bad and i ask why and then their answer is it just is i'm like okay well if the, if you see an issue here then then it should be your obligation as a person to break it down and find the opportunity if you're saying okay this community is struggling okay well now let's break it down let's be like okay here is the root cause now i can go in and provide value to that community like like it could be literally the podcast community, right? You, you, like I could have just said, okay, podcast editing is annoying. But if I hadn't looked for, looked to see, see, the interesting thing is I had looked and I was going to create a, pl a, pr a program that did exactly what um, autopod.fm does. And, it, and so I looked into it and then um, I knew I didn't have the expertise to do it, but I was starting to look into it, and then the tool came out. But the fact is that, hey, I might have not been able to take advantage because there were people already doing it, but the fact that I looked into it and didn't just take it as that sucks because that's the way it is, it's, it's, I just think there are a lot of societal issues that people refuse to look at because they have a good life. Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, that's, wow, that's a great way to put it because... 
for me, like a lot of people come to me and they're like, bro, like, how are you always doing different things? How are you like so motivated? And I'm like, I grew up living under a tin roof with six other people inside of a side of a house. And when it rained, I would feel raindrops on top of my head. Like I did not grow up in a privileged life and I, I didn't grow up very, I grew up very happy, but I was only happy through ignorance. Like I didn't know just how bad I had it because everybody else on the island had it as bad. When I moved to the U.S. and I realized like the different hierarchies of how people were living, it opened up my mind to how many problems I had in my life. And it was it was a, a benefit of how my mom raised me that that didn't break me, but instead motivated me. It showed me that step by step, if I kept um, overcoming each of these individual problems, I would inevitably reach to a point that is better than where I started at. And that is something that you cannot fabricate in someone. If someone has an easy life, it is very, very difficult to try and fix other people's problems because you're picking up a burden that wasn't necessarily yours. But that's what I find I love about entrepreneurs and innovators is that that's their nature. And while it doesn't always come from a hard life, it might come from facing hard problems. Because when you look at the, the audio thing that you were trying to fix, your first idea is like, oh, I want to build this. And you had no idea how to do it. And that was you picking up a burden, putting it on your shoulders and saying, you know, I'm going to walk down this path because I think there needs to be a solution here. And even though someone else is doing it, to me, the lesson I would learn is that you were on track, right? Like you came up with an idea pretty much out of just your own head. And there were other people that already validated that. And these are people that are probably 10, 15 years older than you that have 10 to 15 years of expertise. So if you can get a nugget of an idea and have it that right, just off of a guess, you should probably keep creating things. Yeah. And so, so what you're saying about hard times, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no, you know, I'm no scientist. I'm no social scientist like you are, but if, if we look at the facts, um, and this is one thing that you hear brought up a lot in the race argument, but I think, I think it's, it, it, you, you could use it there, but I think we can move it to a completely different side of things. If you look at the data, first and second generation immigrants are some of the most wealthy people in our country. And there's a reason for that because they are grateful for the opportunities given to them. I mean, I've certainly had a much better life than you growing up. You know, I've always had a, a roof uh, over my head and I've always had, I've never had to worry about, about whether I was going to be fed the next day. But I've, I've had my, my fair share of issues, but I think the, the biggest thing is gratefulness, being grateful for the opportunities that lie in front of you. Heck, you might have it harder, but guess what the best part is? You have the opportunity to make a better life for your children. And so, so look, look, at, look at the NBA. Nine, like 50% of those guys come from some of the, or more, come from some of the worst places on the, uh, in our country. But they have proven time and time again that you can easily, not easily, but through hard work, you can, you can climb your way out and climb to the top of the mountain. And so I think the biggest issue in our country is a lack of gratefulness for the opportunity opportunities that lie in front of us and and that's why immigrants tend to be so freaking successful because they are so freaking grateful i would i would absolutely agree and you know i think the lack of gratefulness actually stems from the fact that people don't know what they want right we uh, like you see it all the time people are on the internet screaming i want this i want that and then when you put it in front of them they're actually like mm -hmm. That isn't exactly what I thought it would be. And the way I can kind of uh, kind of bring that down is and make a concrete example is, again, with like the idea of universal basic income or the idea of, you know, um, everyone should be able to live without working. And like those are these utopian ideals that people don't think about. Like, what are the repercussions of that, right? What, what, what happens to a society of people that are all just fed, that are all provided safety, that are all just basically coddled and told, you don't have to do anything. You deserve to just be happy because you're happy. Who pays the price for that? Right. Because there's always a price. There's always someone that has to take all the suffering in order for everyone else to be happy. And I think with immigrants, a lot of people that come to this this country as first and second generation, they're the people in their family that take all of that suffering for the, the, the future generations to come. And I think that's why their life it might not be the happiest, but they're some of the most fulfilling. 
Yeah, and so I was just looking something up on my phone because I wanted to use it as an example. Like, when you talk about being fed, right, and having these things, you know what country promised that to their people? Mm. North Korea. And you, you hear uh, Yaomi Park. Uh, she's been on Joe Rogan's podcast. She's uh, very, very big and very inf- influential. And she is a defector from North Korea. And she talks about, they promised our people you will always have you know, you know, I promise you, you will have, you know, X, Y, and Z in terms of food, and you will have this, and you will have this. That country is one of the poorest countries in the world. The, the people can't escape. They can't leave. They will get killed if they leave. The, you, once they leave, they can, go, can't go to any country that has a North Korean embassy. They will be assassinated. So if you look at the facts that you want universal basic income, Go look at that country. That's what that country has. That country has this. And so that's when you look at equality versus equity, where yeah. equity is the fact that no matter how hard you work, you get the same thing. And so when people say universal basic income, they, it, it sounds utopian. But then when you ask them if, um, if you were in school and you, you got an A+, plus, and then Jimmy over there got an F, and your teacher comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to take half of your grade and give it to Jimmy, and now you both have a C. Um, yeah. And, and then it starts to sound less appealing. I think people have to, that's where it comes down to critical thinking. Politicians, their job is to make what they want to happen sound as utopian and as perfect as possible. That is what they are paid to do. That is how they get where they are. And so what, what people, when people, what, so if you take a step back and you look at the fact that, okay, all of these ideas that are being brought up in politics, um, that, that make their way to the media, they are the utopianized, they are the, um, they are the ide- idealized version of the, of the idea. And what you have to do is you've got to take the, here's the ideal, and then, so universal basic income. Okay, let's say, so let's say Pablo Picasso, where I'm just going to use a, a guy so that I don't go anywhere political. Okay, Pablo Picasso is the guy saying it's good. But, 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 so you've got to take, okay, here's his utopian idea, and then here's nor- what happened when they did it in North Korea. Let's compare the two. Realize that, 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 that one, one is what happened, one is what could happen. The, the answer lies somewhere in between as what would happen here, but I think you have to look at it, and you've got to find a way to de-idealize and de-utopianize these ideas so you can look at the reality. Yeah, and you know, you're touching on a point that I think is very important to to uh, look at. Uh, Jordan Peterson, I was reading his book uh, Maps of Meaning and Architecture of Belief, and he was breaking down um, his transition from you know kind of this standard Christian uh, child to then becoming an activist, um, kind of a politician that was trying to fix the world, to now becoming a psychologist. And he says throughout his journey, one of the things that he realized was that ideology as a whole is a flawed system, right? Because it will always have you believing in something in the best case scenario, and it will force you to kind of take all the worst case scenarios and push it out of your head. So whether that's you being a Christian, whether that's you being a Republican, whether that's you being a Democrat, whether that's you being LGBTQ, whatever those ideologies are that you subscribe to, if you're not constantly questioning them and trying to update them, then you run the risk of the people at the head of those ideologies shifting it and making it so that you're just following their vision, their dreams, kind of like what you said the politicians do. And, you know, the facts point to that we don't need an easier society. We don't need a more equitable society. I don't know where people are getting this idea that that's the need right now. There are more people on the planet that are dying of obesity than starvation. Like, we are fixing the a lot of the issues that we have surrounding humanity, like, struggles. The, that's not the issue. What the issue is now, we have so many people that aren't struggling that we don't know what to do. We don't have any generalized purpose or, or or thing to put all of this energy into, right? Like there's no, you have people that are living and then they're living off um, uh, food stamps. And then we don't have any jobs for these people to do. We have no creative outlets for these people to do. And then we provide them with drugs. So like when you have those like equations all building into something, we don't need more and more people to have more and more things. We need them to have more opportunities. We need to educate them better. And then we need to be able to give them um, purpose. And that isn't 
easy. That's not letting people lay down and just take what comes to them. It's in inviting people to go out and say, hey, with all these new resources, here's a society that needs help. Please help us. Yeah, and I, I think it um, – and, and, I, and I almost think that, that it is interesting because one of the things that makes that so hard is the um, – the victimization of, of 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 a group of people where if if you're in a if you're in a community that that is told constantly that you are the victim you are the victim it becomes the victim olympics and now now all you do is walk around saying you're the victim but guess what heck you might be the victim but 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 put in some hard work and next thing you know you can you can solve the problem that made you a victim and so that's that's what i don't understand and i understand how it's happening but i don't understand but but i and i understand why because i think a lot of it comes down to politics and on on this show i'll touch on po- politics but like as a 16 year old it's it's i can't even vote so what is it is it really my place to to go talking about my political takes they don't matter but but when i when i look at it as a society and i'm like I, I, I hate seeing people being told they're the victim. Like, hey, your m- life might suck, and heck, you might be, you might have some some victimhood in in your reality. But the fact is, being told you're a victim constantly is only going to make your problems worse. If if you know the 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 um the communities, if communities are constantly being told that they are dealing with this issue and it's these people's fault, mm-hmm. you you could. I think I think if you're going to victimize someone, you've got, the the best way. This might sound counterintuitive. The best way to get someone to solve their own situation is tell it tell them it's their own yeah. damn fault, yeah. because that way they can recognize that hey, me blaming someone else for my own issues is never going to solve them. The only way I can solve them is by outworking the issues that face me. If there are people working to suppress you, working to working to make your lives harder, the only way you can escape that is by outworking those people. Yeah, and you know, I think the the reason why this conversation is so difficult is because you you walk this very thin line where everyone deserves empathy for their their situation, and everyone deserves um, you know an ear to to their problems. Especially coming from my background, like we're taught to just listen and and validate, right? But there's also this other end of it where a part of um, helping someone, whether mentally, physically, um, or otherwise, is that you do have to paint these hard pictures for them and say, at the end of the day, the steps that are needed to fix this problem will be required from you. And regardless of how many knives you have in your backs, chains you have around your neck, or problems that are in front of you, you're the person that's going to have to solve them. Now, if you, at the start of that journey, and you're saying, I'm going to go through this as a victim and I'm going to keep that mentality throughout. You're not going to get to the end of that journey. You're going to wait along the way for someone to come save you. But if you go through it and said, I've been hurt in the past, my people have suffered in the past, but I'm going to make sure they never do that again, then you leave that journey as a hero. And that's the journey that I feel more, more people need to take. Yeah, and one one thing I've noticed is even even just taking a look at relationships, it, you can you can look at it from from that point of view, where like like I I had I had a girlfriend for you know six months and then she broke up with me, but I didn't I didn't mope around. I had seen my best friend mope around because of a breakup, and I wasn't gonna let that happen. And so instead of moping around, what I did is I I replaced the time I was spending her with her with two internships, ramped up the podcast, and just became a better person. And so I think that when, like, that sucked, but it, but I took the, the two weeks to get over it, and then I started working hard. And so I think, and, and, and I, I immediately just realized, like, hey, like, my, the way I can get, rev- like, my own I- mental revenge for whatever happened to me is by is by proving to myself that I am better than than whoever whatever happened to me in every way possible. So that's the mindset I took to that problem in my life and I've become better because of it. So you can take these personal issues and I think that's where it starts. It it you can't immediately go from a victim 
to say, to helping an entire community. Mm-hmm. You have to start with yourself. You've got to start with, okay, what hardship just happened to me, and how can I work hard so that that hard so that I am a better person because of it and improve myself to the point where that hardship won't happen again. And then you ca- just scale. You got to take it as a you got to take an entrepreneurial mindset to your own self where you can't just randomly go and be as big as Microsoft tomorrow. You have to start small. You've got to work hard and you've got to put in the time, energy and effort. It will suck. It will be hard. You might you might fail, but you're going to have to get back up every time and keep working if you want to get there. Yeah, you know, it's as simple as you said it. It's really a game of consistency. It's a game of belief. And if you don't believe in what you're doing and if you aren't consistent in what you're doing, you'll never get past that point, man. And, um, you know, it, it's dope hearing you talk about, like, your experiences because I, I stayed away from um, any serious relationships while I was younger. I'm still young right now, but I still kind of do that. And the, one of the main reasons is because it has that, like, it has that chance of you meet someone that you care about so much and – you devote all of this time and energy and um, you start building this like future with them in your head. And when that comes crashing down, especially as an entrepreneur or someone trying to build something, it can throw you off your pivot completely. So kudos to you for, you know, sticking through that. And yeah, I I would say, man, like while this generation has a lot of problems, it falls into that category of solvable problems that we talked about. So there is such an open playing field for innovative minds right now because there's so many problems that need to be solved. Like there's a chance for this conversation, someone to see it, hear you talking and say, hey, this is perfect. We needed more people in the 16 to 18 year old range that can come have a conversation about about these issues because we didn't even know we had these issues in the first place. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic on what the future is going to look like yeah i'm 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 definitely optimistic and i think i think my optimism lies in the fact that i i know the problems that i faced and i and and i'm committed to helping other people solve those problems and so if you if if you are if you're in a position where you where you've gone through what someone else has gone through i almost think it's your your job in a in and your role in society to help that person through it because you've dealt with that thing. I mean, I got lucky where okay, yes, I yes, I had this mental image in my head during that relationship, but um but she decided to break up with me in a way that proved to me she would never be worth anything to me. And mm-hmm. and and and, and, and pro- which is interesting because um it, it was in a way where she was hypocritical, you know, all of these different things and it 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 was made it very easy for me to detach my mental detach myself from that and just be like hey i've been living in a false reality for five months let's get back to to reality and um and and solve these issues i'm i'm optimistic for the future um very very optimistic especially as i see i'm i'm a part of a program called apogee strong and i did a joint post with them where it was a guy who was talking about where i he, me and him were talking something some about it but the entire thing is it's a it's a it's a mentorship program for young men that where and the entire concept is building 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 tomorrow's leaders and i i graduated that program did that entire one year program now i'm a battle squad leader uh, doing accountability calls there and it it gets me optimistic that are that there are things like that and i get to see young men who are taking action who are doing all of these things and i'm excited to see because that organization they are now they they started a dad's program and now Soon they're going to be launching a, a program for women, you know, just and, and it gets me optimistic because there are things like that. And I and I'm getting to watch the the one percent of my generation being built right in front of my eyes. And I know these people. And now one day there are multiple people in that program who I guarantee will be multimillionaires one day. And I'm excited because I get to be I'm optimistic for my own future. And I think that's the best any of us can do. I think that sometimes the best thing we can do for ourselves is take a step back, take a take a step away from the issues of the world focus on ourselves and know that that the only thing we can do to change the world is change ourselves and work to change the world we can't we can't change the world through ideologies we have to put in the work to make our to make what we want a reality yeah that's nail it on the head um you know just to give a quick touch point because i think it's very important for people to understand that word reality that is 
a very, very, very big concept, and we don't need to get all the way into it right now, but the simplest thing that we can say is that we do create our own realities. We wake up every single day and we validate the things that we believe. We believe, and there's a benefit and a danger to that, where if you put in your head that your future is going to be X, Y, and Z, and it's terrible, and you don't have any options, your reality will match those thoughts. Right, Humans are one of the only creatures that can mold, shape, and shift reality. And with that power, we have to be very responsible. I don't mean to sound like Uncle Ben, but that's the only way that I yeah. can think of it. No, so. your, your, your thoughts become your reality, and your reality becomes your thoughts. So you have to be intentional about what you're thinking about, how you're thinking about it, and the way you approach life. A thousand percent. Yeah, I mean, you know, my my biggest thing moving forward is that I have put a lot of uh, sweat equity into how my my mental landscape is, and you know, um, having a lot of self validation in myself because even you you've said it uh, several times during this podcast, and I, I want you to take it out of your vocabulary where you're like because I'm young or because I'm this, my value or whatever, it doesn't matter. And I'm one of, one of the things I want to say for you right now, and it's, it's a hurdle that I want to overcome, is that that's going to be an easy excuse and it's going to be something that people are going to use against you a lot, but don't listen to it. I have a background in psychology and right now I'm building out large language, la- large language model generative agents, right? I have nothing to do with this space, but because I understand that I can learn and I can build and I can grow... I don't let anyone downplay my opinions, regardless of what qualifiers they want to put in front of me. So I would just say, you know, this is a generation where you can do whatever you want. So might as well talk about it, no matter how old you are. Definitely. And I think that when I say that, it, it, it comes from a a, um, a slight, like I have I have lots of confidence in myself, but I think it comes from a, a fear of, of judgment in the landscape we live in today where you could overnight have, you know, like I'm, I'm not notable enough to get canceled, but like, but like there is that, that culture and that mentality and it comes from a bit of fear. And I, I think I, I, I definitely could, could eliminate that. But I, the only times I really use that is when I talk about something that I don't know much about, where I, I think that I could replace it with, with I don't know much about this, because I don't know much about politics, right? I mean, it's not like I've dove into that, but I will when it's my, when, when it's my time where I can actually have an influence on it. But at this point, it's, it's I, so I guess what I'm saying is I will, I will replace that with because I haven't learned much about this or because... Um, I guess, yeah, don't use, that's actually one of the things that I talk, I like to talk about is at, at my age, your age is your greatest asset. It's not a weakness. Mm-hmm. The fact that I've gotten um, incredibly notable people with hundreds of thousands of followers across social media onto my podcast, they wouldn't have accepted it if I was a 40-year-old man sitting on my couch with a beer belly. But the fact that I'm a 16-year-old who wants to have these hard conversations, it sets me apart. It, it, it sets me apart from from much of society and it gives you an advantage and I'm going to put a piece of content out um, on Instagram later this week that's talking about um, like how I was able to network with people like that like that and it, it all comes down to understanding that something everyone tells you is a weakness can usually be used as an asset and and one of the biggest things is that the people that will not talk to you because of your age are not the people you should be talking to point blank 100 percent, man and yeah like i said before it's kudos for everything that you're doing you definitely stood out to me as well like i've been invited to a couple of podcasts and i've said no because just genuinely i feel like i have enough conversations in my day-to-day life where i don't particularly need to come on and um talk about it but this has been fun and i i feel like i might end up doing a couple more i would love to have you on mine as yeah. well um man, we're gonna, I- go ahead yeah. You know, you go ahead. Keep keep talking. No, I was just gonna say, we um, I think our next event, like live podcast mixture event, is gonna be something where um, we bring through some um people from uh, you probably know him, Alex Trump. We're trying to get him, his Evolution Accelerator, a couple other investors, um, mentors, and pair them up in face to face meeting and networking with the entrepreneurs that are building the things they want to invest in. So we have that as a live podcast, run a panel and everything. We definitely yeah want to yeah. Let, let let me know when that's happening. I uh, I got to uh, be on set for uh, for an episode that Rodney was doing for Com Stocks with Alex Chomp, and uh, gonna get gonna get him on the podcast at some point. He offered to come on when I was there. I just 
never got his info and then sent he hasn't responded via dm but yeah i mean i'd i'd love to come on do 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 whatever i can to provide value i want to start doing some guesting because po- do, being the host is fun but getting interviewed is just just as uh just as enjoyable so i'm just excited to uh to provide value in any way i can and just i just want to uh, give you a a big thank you for coming on here this is uh, I all of my all of my episodes that I've had to delay tend to be some of my favorites. I don't know why, but it's so I I had an episode uh, a, another guest that has had to delay, and now I'm really looking forward to that episode. But uh, thank you so much for coming on here. Thank you for making time for me. I really appreciate it. No, of course, and I mean thank you for the conversation as well. You give me a lot of hope, um, you know. And I also I'm gonna send you over some information on the project that I'm working on because I think you'd really like it. Um, it. It wraps into a lot of what we're saying. You know, technology is used to amplify the human potential, and if we can target that um, and and build out these systems that take the best knowledge that we have available and provide it in bite-sized pieces, actionable pieces to people, I think we'd have a cool society going forward. So I'd love to get your feedback on that in the future man but yeah you know if you need any help with finding some guests or anything just let me know and i'd love to even double back in the future and see where everything is at yes sir all right thank you guys at home for watching i'm parker Imerell. i've been talking to joshi mar graham and this has been the conversation station